Olá, boa tarde. Eu sou Rodrigo Borba, coordenador aqui do Programa Interdisciplinar de Pós-Graduação em Linguística Aplicada. E venho aqui, então, dar início à nossa aula inaugural do segundo semestre do, do ano de 2022, uh, que estamos aqui, então, recebendo o professor Alfonso Delperti. A gente recebeu inscrições não só do nosso corpo discente e docente, mas nós recebemos inscrições de vários lugares do Brasil, e, inclusive de diferentes países do mundo. É, o Alfonso vai falar em inglês, eu vou falar em português, a gente vai fazer esse translanguaging, ele vai falar por aproximadamente 40, 45 minutos, e ao final a gente vai ter tempo para perguntas. Uh, so, Alfonso will be speaking for about 40 to 45 minutes, for those of you who do not speak uh, Portuguese and translating. Uh, so there will be so there will be some, some 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 time in the end for questions. Questions can be uh, can be uh, uh, written in the chat on YouTube. There will be no interaction in video, so you can write your comments and questions on the chat. And questions, comments may be written both in Portuguese and in English. Podem escrever as perguntas tanto em português quanto em inglês que eu repasso para o Alfonso ao final. Então, quem é o nosso, nosso palestrante de hoje? Alfonso Delpertio é professor associado de linguística aplicada no University College London. Através de abordagens etnográficas e discursivas, suas pesquisas investigam as relações entre linguagem e economia política. Nesse contexto, ele analisa o papel da linguagem em dinâmicas de, de migração e governamentalidade, com foco especial sobre relações de trabalho e desigualdade social. Tem diversas publicações em periódicos de renome internacional, assim como livros e capítulos publicados por editoras como Routledge, Bloomsbury, Wiley, Oxford University Press, entre outras. Seus trabalhos recentes incluem as coletâneas Language, Education and New Liberalism, Critical Studies in Social Linguistics, organizado com Misha Flubacher em 2017, Language and New Liberal Governmentality, organizado com a Luisa Martin, Martin Rojo, e publicado em 2019, e o, número, e o número especial da International Journal of the Sociology of Language sobre Language, Work and Effective Capitalism, organizado com Kati Dlask e publicado esse ano, recentemente publicado em 2022. Além disso, o professor Delpertio é também co-editor do periódico Language, Culture and Society, que é um dos periódicos mais interessantes do nosso campo ultimamente. Então, eu vou, sem mais delongas, with no more further ado, eu vou passar você, vou passar para vocês, professor Alfonso, a quem eu agradeço muitíssimo por ter aceito o nosso convite. Thank you, Alfonso, for accepting to deliver the talk today for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rodrigo, and thanks to all of you for, um, for being here. Thanks, Rodrigo, again, for inviting me. I apologize in advance. I'm going to speak in English. My Portuguese is not good enough um, to kind of give a, give a talk um, in, in this language. So I'm, I'm going to um, do it in English. But you can ask, as Rodrigo said, you can ask your questions in, in, in your language or in English or in whatever other language you want. You're, I'm sure you're going to manage. Um, uh to understand each other and i'm also going to try not to speak too long so that we have at the end enough time to kind of interact uh with each other so i am gonna share my powerpoint Voila. um i hope you can see it okay so then i'm gonna start so language is political it is entangled with social inequality, violence, and oppression. Language, its construction, celebration, or stigmatization serves the making of capitalism and colonialism. Language perpetuates imperial desires and nationalist sentiments. Language is there to dominate, to legitimize and naturalize genocide. Language vehiculates and normalizes powerful, often morally loaded ideas about people, about how they are meant to be, how they should conduct themselves, and how they are supposed to interact, act upon, and exploit the social and natural world surrounding them. Its regulation and standardization is tied up with the making of naturalized forms of personhood, which map on racial, gender, and class lines of division. 
Language is a weapon. Who owns language has an army, dominates the world. And therefore, its access, circulation, and consumption needs to be regulated and possibly unequally distributed. We are aware of this. We are outraged. We have attempted to change this, to reimagine language for a more inclusive, more equal and peaceful world. The establishment of sociolinguistics in the mid 1950s was one among many other attempts around the world to study, understand and transform the oppressive effects of language. In state bureaucracies, health systems, as well as in schools, at work, in our communities, at home. Language scholars have produced alternative, more emancipatory knowledge about language. The stigmatizing and oppressive effects of its use, regulation, valuation, and consumption needed to be challenged, rethought, subverted. We surrounded ourselves with an entire apparatus of resistance. We established departments, study groups, developed research projects, funded journals, trained students and teachers, engaged with policymakers, communities, language planners, employers, health systems. We constructed the whole publishing industry circulating our critical drafts, polished papers, books, reports, and recommendations. What makes our resistance possible? What makes that our critical work on language can circulate, that it's taken up and integrated into projects of resistance and change? What makes that some of the stories about language in society we tell, we tell get heard? That some of us manage to participate in larger debates about language and its entrenchment with inequality and oppression? In their recent work on language, capitalism, and colonialism, Monica Heller and Bonnie Michelini argued that one way of studying the intersections between language and political economy is to ask what, at, what, why at specific moments in time specific critiques of language take center stage? Why does our work on language and social inequality matter to people, especially people in power? When, why, how, and with what effects does our critical expertise get absorbed, appropriated and invested in by those social, political, and economic actors whose actions, power, and agendas we actually intend to challenge, denounce, resist? I know it's counterintuitive. We are all used to understand our analysis, our stories, our critiques as marginal, as invisible, as ineffective. And at the same time, you're here. I am here. I was invited by you. We speak, we debate, and circulate our knowledge. So what are the conditions of possibility of our own resistance? Differently from liberal political theorists who understand power and resistance as opposites, power as oppression, resistance as emancipation, I would like to introduce an analytical shift which allows me to understand resistance not as a practice expressed from a position of exteriority to capitalism and colonialism. Our resistance, I argue, rather takes shape from within the very structures of power and oppressions we intend to dismantle and transform. I'm inspired by the work of Kat Tebaldi, Jackie Wola, and Abu Lugold on resistance and social critique and Michel Foucault's worker on power and counterconduct, who all invite us to rethink a, remont a romanticized and maybe not so useful understanding of resistance as an expression of, of a heroic, conscious, free will of resisting people, and rather understand our practices of resistance as a diagnostics of power. With Jackie Wola, I ask, why does our resistance take the shape it takes? And what is our resistance telling us about the forms of disciplinary control, modernization, and oppression in which our practices of resisting are enmeshed? I will address these questions by thinking aloud about my own resistance practices. In this second part of my talk, I'll represent three different projects that I developed in the last two years in collaborations with several other colleagues and discuss what my own production, circulation, and consumption of critique on language and social inequality tells us about power, control, and about my own contradictions and those I have to navigate, about my attempts to challenge the capitalist and colonial system with which academia is entangled, 
and about me ending up serving and feeding this very same oppressive system. I'm speaking about myself, but I think that this talk may have implications for our entire field. I'm uh, implications for those of, of us who conduct research on, on inequality and oppression, for those of us holding positions of power in our departments and programs, and maybe, why not, even implications for those of us who are new into this business. We are all into this, and we are all complicit with the structures of oppression we intend to contest. So first, production. What makes that my critique can be produced and expressed? What makes this possible? So to answer this question, I'm going to talk about a project that I developed with a group of scholars in Chile, Latin America, um, and especially a conference I recently organized um, online on language education and social inequality. When we started to think about this event, together with Romiana Balonchaf, Marco Espinoza, Gabriel, uh, Gabriel Alvarado, and Thuyen Agbeti, the idea was to engage with the constitutional process in Chile. A bit of context. In the last two years, Chile underwent a historical process. For the first time since its independence from the Spanish Empire in 1810, a constitutional convention was mandated to draft a new constitution, which, and that was the intention, had to radically change the way the nation and political power is imagined and organized. In this context, a number of social actors were mobilizing their ideas about language to further their own political and economic agendas. While some strove for more inclusiveness, others were profoundly undemocratic. The Chilean far-right weaponized language to a point where a conversation and deliberation in the public sphere had become impossible. Together with my Chilean colleagues, we thought that as, as, that as sociolinguists, we may have something to contribute to a larger discussion about how knowledge about the future of Chile can be produced within and beyond academia. We thought that we could contribute to a reconceptualization of what language is and what language does about its place in history, society, education, and political economy, and about the place of language in a future Chile which this new, supposedly democratic, egalitarian, and feminist constitution was meant to build upon. As you probably know, the new constitution was rejected by a large majority. I think there is a lot to be said about this rejection, but for today, I would like to focus about why I thought I had anything meaningful to say about this political process. Why us? Why me? I have never been to Chile. I have read about the constitutional process in the media. I know about it through the work of my former doctoral student, Romiana Balonchaf, and through the scholarship of Marco Espinoza, with whom I'm co-working, uh, co-writing. But I don't know anything about Chile, about how language is imagined and invested in that country, about how it, it intersects with inequality and serves processes of power and domination. So again, why me? Yes, of course, I wanted to support my Chilean co-organizer, Romy, Gabriel, and Marco, to show my solidarity, to build political alliances across institutional and geographical boundaries. I wanted to engage with my friends and my colleagues. I wanted to help them to make their critique hurt. I wanted to support them in having an impact. And why not? I wanted myself to have an impact on such an important process. I wanted to matter. I wanted my expertise on language to matter. And of course, I could do that because of the position of power I occupy in the global political economy of knowledge, because of my privilege. I could do that because UCL, my university, my employer, has a global engagement strategy. You don't know UCL? UCL is the institution whose ideas and knowledge help transform the world. We challenge, we question we impact, and we have money to do this. In a recent article revisiting the history of my faculty within, the, within UCL, the Institute of Education, my colleagues Elaine Unterhalter and Laila Kadival explained that my institution's obsession with wanting to impact the way people think, feel, and act globally 
is not new. Already in the early 1950s, when celebrating the 50th anniversary of my faculty's foundation, Sir Christopher Cox, the educational advisor to the British Colonial Office, delivered a lecture celebrating the increasing importance of my institution's involvement with colonial education in, and I quote, guiding and helping colonial people to stand on their own feet, unquote. Cox's lecture was delivered with the Secretary of State for Colonies in the chair, a very public display of the close relationship between the university, the government, and colonial education in initiatives that at that time a university liked to be known about. Unterhalter and Kadival argue that the history of our institution, our training of teachers, our support and advising of policy work, our development of theories of language, education, and learning, as well as our propagation of pedagogical models, all this was closely imbricated with UK's colonial politics and marked by relationships of exclusion, hierarchy, epistemological violence, and silencing. My colleagues also argue that beyond the field of education, we have also engaged in interdisciplinary collaborations with the London School of Economics, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and the School of Oriental and African Studies, in order to make interventions in the domain of health, public hygiene, and economic development. We not only have trained the colonies' teachers and the teachers of the teachers, but also the future colonial needs and supported colonial administrations in propagating liberal Western values, what we called ordered freedom, and all this to meet the demands of modern capitalism. So my global engagement strategy, the Conference on Language, Education, and Social Inequality, which was meant to feed the constitutional process in Chile, to put our expertise at the, dispo at the service of all those actors who considered the constitutional process an opportunity for a more just Chilean society, this very same project was funded through, this, through the support of the IOE International Fund Scheme, which is obviously not external to these oppressive processes and imperial desires in which my faculty has historically participated. We want to work across many countries because we want our research, consultancy, and collaborative partnerships to shape policy for governments, international and national agencies, charities, and the private sector around the world. And this because our 120 year existence has reflected and contributed to changes in individuals' lives and society on a global scale. We are proud of our colonial legacy and we wanna celebrate our history. So first contradiction, our joint attempt to contest and challenge what we consider to be problematic notions of language and society our willingness to put our critique of language at the service of the Chilean people, to change the hegemonic narratives of language education and social inequality, the conference I co-organized was part of a larger institutional attempt to keep propagating colonial knowledge. Critique and power, resistance and oppression, colonialism and decoloniality became part of the same hegemonic practice. Our institution does not only fund our critique, our resistance, it also marketizes it and circulates it on social media. And we, of course, benefit from it. Our way out of this contradiction was to conceptualize this event as an attempt to reappropriate the university, to refuse to surrender to the, to the domestication of universities and the colonial apparatuses they serve, to steal from what our, universe, uh, from what our institution has to offer and to use their resources to resist. We intended to resist not just by propagating knowledge which challenge hegemonic narratives about language, but also by transforming the rules of the game, by changing how conferences are done. We, re we redistributed the power of who can speak and who not. We let PhD students speak in a separate slot from, in a separate slot from the real academics, but they were allowed to speak. We invited Chilean political activists, local educators, organizations from outside academia to contribute with their knowledge. We put in place a Spanish-English translation system, helping us to challenge the dominance of English. 
But of course, and this was the real paradox, we were not able, or maybe we did not consider it necessary, to interpret any other languages spoken by those minority speakers whose struggles we wanted to support. Let's just forget for a moment that this was an online conference and that we used Zoom, the technology of a global industry which managed to make money out of the suffering of billions of people globally. It was free for us. We could all use it. Also, let's forget that we paid our translators a low wage, reproducing the exploitative conditions of language work, which we have been criticizing for decades. And probably most importantly, <clears throat> let's just avoid talking about the silences of our non-academic interlocutors, their disinterest, their abyssal gap between our academic interventions and what people on the ground had to say about language. What mattered was that we, including myself, we were able to express our knowledge, that our expertise could be heard. What mattered what was that I won, my university won, and by letting my department add an additional line to its track record of international interventions, I won again. I will come back to this point later. Second, circulation. Now, of course, not just our production of knowledge is mediated, framed, and enabled by the very same racist and capitalist infrastructures that we want to challenge, also the circulation of our knowledge. Last year, Romia Nabalon Schaaf and I put together the Garmin public ethnographers to train international PhD students in communicating their findings to the communities and organizations they work with. The idea was to supplement UCL's PhD training with what we considered to be politicized work, work that was critical, work that resisted. Focusing on international students was for us a means to challenge the systemic racism that is exas exacerbated by an elite university like mine, in which the knowledge produced by racialized non-local students is often understood as second class, non-scientific and deficient. We also wanted to challenge the power relations between teachers and students. We were all learners. Like the PhD students, I had to participate in the program too. My university funded the training because the so-called improved learning experience of our PhD students allow my university to differentiate itself from other universities with supposedly poor student learning experiences. This then would help my university to please the rating agencies, agencies which evaluate and rank universities, and of course also allow UCL to keep augmenting the revenues coming from international student fees. The motto is clear. Our institute is the world leading faculty of education, and this for nine years in a row. Let's remain at the very top of the rankings, and please don't forget the annual 20% student growth target that will allow us to keep buying property in London, build new fancy campuses, preferably in East London, where it's still affordable to gentrify neighborhoods and displace the workers I study. What also appealed to our funders was the supposedly innovative training Rome and I had designed. Local communities and organizations had to be engaged by the early career scholars we trained, not through reports or speeches like this one, but through art, comics, pictures, videos, installations, public performances. Art, and preferably embodied art, art which puts the researcher's body at the center of knowledge production and knowledge circulation. Fancy art needed to be what these international students had to, to do to circulate their ideas and possibly induce a change. Again, we wanted to help people to stand on their own feet both our students and the people they work with. Innovation, of course, is another of those metrics that matter to us. Innovation makes us feel different, makes us remain number one in the world. Innovation is growth, students, money. Second contradiction. This embodied innovation is not new. The body, both in terms of its social, psychological, and biological meaning, and the use of artistic expression to circulate this meaning has always been at the core of the modern scientific project, especially when knowledge had to serve the management and reproduction of life, 
the classification and ranking of people, the improvement of the white race, the disciplining and regulation of the laborer's body, and the pathologization of feminism and, and women's rebellion. Our institute did not see these connections with past oppressive forms of knowledge production and circulation, and an amnesia, which maybe was due to the fact that UCL was itself heavily involved in the propagation of this harmful knowledge about the body, not just through our colonial legacy, but also more recently through the hosting of the so-called London Conference of Intelligence, which between 2014 and 2017 brought together scholars interested in the genetics of intelligence. Then this means the interconnection between race and intelligence, an annual con conference celebrating eugenics, which was anchored in a longer history of eugenics research at UCL. Eugenics is the science of racial improvement and plant breeding. By hosting the Galton Laboratory, UCL did not only provide a platform for Francis Galton, the founding father of eugenics, but also contributed to the circulation of, of ideas which throughout the 20th century have legitimized and authorized the submission, colonization, and extermination of millions of people. What a dilemma. How could we be innovative how could we use art and the body for knowledge circulation? How could we improve the training of our students without reproducing racist genres that we had learned to contest? Genres that harm. In a recent talk on anti-feminism, white supremacy and the language of the far right, Catherine Tivaldi argued that white supremacists have developed sophisticated communication techniques to propagate their oppressive ideology. They do not only aestheticize hate, but also politicize the body. She argued that one way of fighting fascism is to co-opt the language of the Nazis, their modes of expression, to become like them, even better. It was as if Romy and I had heard her thoughts, that we had anticipated what Catherine was going to present at a conference. Um, that, that we had anticipated what Catherine was going to present at a conference many months after the end of our program. What if we could do the same thing? What if we could co-opt the Nazis' communicative strategies? We appropriate the body, politicize it, just differently, of course, in a way that it would allow us to make a critique of inequality and oppression. Also, what if we could co-opt neoliberal notions of innovation? but not for capital accumulation, but for critique? What if we could steal the ideas and techniques of those actors we actually hate and make them serve our revolution? What a brilliant idea. We invited two political artists to teach us how to use art to transform the way we circulate our critique of inequality and violence. The two political artists designed a training for us guiding all participants, including me, in the design and conduct of a public artistic performance. Reclaiming the city was the overarching theme they suggested. Before applying what we had learned in the communities and organizations we were doing research in, public performance had to be tested in London, far away from our research site, which were often located in what we have learned to call the Global South. Reclaiming the city seemed to us an important frame, especially since, as mentioned, our university had been one of the main actors of gentrification of London's impoverished peripheries. So yes, let's reclaim the city. Let's strike back. After the first couple of weeks eagerly absorbing our teachers' innovative insights, the vibes changed when the time came for us to put the acquired techniques into practice. Passion, eagerness, and enthusiasm was replaced by fear, preoccupation, and anxiety. Critique resistance was taken over by the disillusion and resignation. Most of us refused to engage in the exercise. The idea of exposing oneself in public to raise our voice, to communicate a bold message was unimaginable by most of the participating students. Public performance was something that we liked in theory something that we liked to consume, that stimulated our creativity. 
but doing it ourselves, nah. Maybe the fact that the exercise required us to do the artistic performance in London, to actively engage with a society to which most of the students did not feel that they belonged to, about which they did not have anything to say or in which they felt they could not speak up. In any case, the entire project risked to fail. Failed training, failed innovation. Failure was, of course, not something we had anticipated. Failure was not something that our sponsors had anticipated nor accepted. Money was provided, teachers were paid, therefore a product had to be produced. In order to save the unsavable, Romy and I decided to engage with the rest of the group, to talk with students about what triggered um, their refusal. First, we engaged in a collective uh, um, reflexive exercise. Let's just talk about it. Show empathy for each other's insecurities. Then we became impatient. Come on, guys, it's fun, it's innovation, it's the revolution. Art is the future of science. What came out of this prolonged discussion was a type of anxiety that we had not predicted. Exposing one's body, making it take center stage in the public realm, engaging in social critique outside the academic bubble meant for many of our participants to put their own bodies in danger. What we forgot when we decided to invest in public performance as a persuasive, fancy, and innovative tact tactic of knowledge circulation was that we are not all equal. We don't occupy the same position in society. Exposing ourselves in public does not mean the same for each of us. While for some of us engaging in a public aestheticized display of our genius allows us to attract attention, capital, and prestige, for others, the very same aesthetic practice puts them in danger. We shouldn't forget that international students in the UK, while contributing to the growth and wealth of the British higher education industry, they are subjected to surveillance, stigma, repression, and sometimes deportation. They make us rich. They allow us to live a better life, but they are also a threat that needs to be controlled, regulated, and disciplined. Let's take the money, but also let's ensure that they can't harm us. Eventually, the tactic of reflexivity, kindness, and empathy was effective, and we managed to convince the students, or maybe force them, to do what they had subscribed for, do a public performance. Maybe it was the mutual support, the solidarity that we had promised them, or maybe it was more simply them understanding that art was the future of science and resistance, and a new innovative maxim that we all have to subject to in order to be seen as innovators, as researchers ahead of our own fields. In any case, most of us, including myself, accepted, accepted to comply to the task. We did a public performance. This is me walking through the city center of Basel, a small city in German-speaking Switzerland, arguing in favor of a maximum salary for everybody to raise awareness for work exploitation in, in a part of the world which is generally considered to belong to the richest. I did the performance, but I broke the rules. I did not give a shit about equality, about me being like the students attending the program. I used my own power to do the public performance in the city where I live when I don't teach, far away from London. The PhD students, however, followed the rules and all did what they were expected to do, expose themselves in London even if that means putting their own bodies at risk. We were satisfied. The university was satisfied. I could present my success to my funders and add a new line to my CV. I raised my profile. Finally, an innovator. I won again. The university won again. Whether or not our students won as well, I don't know. I maybe did not care. A last example. This time it's about uptake, it's about consumption. What makes our knowledge to be taken up by the publics we intend to talk to? In December 2021, I was contacted by the CEO of Huxby, which stands for happiness of others multiplied by the best of you. A London-based organization which calls itself a community of freelance experts, providing future-proving services plus marketing, creative operations, innovations, communications, and HR. In their email, I was asked to contribute to a book about individualized asynchronous work, work style, as Hoxby called it, 
and about how work style is better for well-being, improves productivity, makes happy workers, and will improve society as a whole. Hoxby wanted me to contribute to what they called breakout boxes, short texts written by several academics like me, which would appear throughout the book and complement the knowledge about our asynchronous and happy work that Hoxby intended to propagate. Given my expertise on language and work, my contribution had to be on how new language can change behavior. So they basically wanted me to say that this term work style would revolutionize the world of work. While of course I did not agree at all with the basic idea that underpins their project, I, I didn't agree with the capitalist integration of happiness in a large system of exploitation. <laughs> there was a critique, however, of work in what Hoxby wanted to do, which I shared, and on which I could, I thought I could build. Alliances, right? I thought, yes, this is my moment. This is my opportunity to impact the world of work to make my expertise matter, to move beyond the academic part. This is different from public performance. This organization is powerful. You really can impact how things are done. You can make a difference, transform exploitation. You can be a hero and you can get promoted. I actually reminded myself of, of how much I struggled in 2019 to respond to the four criteria of promotion when I applied to become associate professor at UCL. I could make a case for my excellent research. I could show that I had a lot of experience in innovation, in, no, in innovative student-centered and research-based teaching. I could even find a way to make a case for institutional citizenship, but enterprise. Showing that I had a track record of transformative collaboration with public organizations and private actors had been almost impossible. Collaborating with Hoxby would change this, I thought. I would please my university. I would have something important to show. Next time when I apply for a promotion, I could win again by letting my university win. My university would win because my collaboration with what seems to be an innovative, highly successful startup would become part of a larger narrative that the university is trying to circulate. Namely that, no, we are not harming London. We are not gentrifying London's peripheries making it more expensive for the local impoverished population to live where they have always lived. We are actually making a huge contribution to UK's economy. A couple of months ago, The Guardian published an article announcing that for the UK, UCL was even better than the other great gentrifier of East, East London, namely the 2012 Olympics. University College London generates 10 billion a year for the UK through its research, knowledge, and support for business startups. It provides a boost to the UK's economy that is comparable to the boost in international trade and inward investment delivered by the 2012 London Olympics, and this every year. My collaboration at Hoxby would not immediately allow them to generate new money, of course, let's be humble. But given their influence, their collaboration with businesses in London and beyond, my expertise would inevitably lead to higher revenues for them and augment UCL's reputation as an agent of economic growth. And at the same time, I would support Hoxby in transforming the world of work and for the better. Subverting so capitalism by supporting it. Wow, that was amazing. What an opportunity. So I enthusiastically accepted uh, Hoxby's invitation and wrote the short text that they asked. So you won't be able to read it, but I'm going to read it for you, or the kind of essential parts of it. In my contribution, I highlighted that language is an instrument for change because communication allows managers to persuade workers to adopt the organization's values as their own. I also argued that language is often a target for change because it enables workers to adjust and regulate their behavior according to these values and to communicate them to their co-workers and the outside world. I explained that notions such as work style are meaningful because they get to stand for specific moralized qualities, which then get to be linked to specific people. Um, yeah, sorry, which then get to be linked to specific people, for example, workers, specific activities, for example, work, and their interpretation for example, the way workers understand work. 
In order to explain this last point, I argued that this linking of specific moralized qualities, for example, happiness, flexibility, freedom, individualism, trust, passion, joy, to specific notions such as work style, and then to specific practices such as work, and specific people such as workers, always coexists with another discursive process, namely erasure. I elaborated on this point by arguing that language normalizes the qualities associated with specific concepts by attributing a sense of cause or immediate necessity to a connection between a quality, a practice, a person, and a concept. But to do this, language must render invisible other meanings that people connect to these notions, such as work style, for example, pain, control, oppression, inequality, all processes and feelings which, however, get silenced in or erased from public discourse. I referenced important and un uncontroversial scholars such as Sue Ngoc, Judith Irvine, Deborah Cameron, Raymond Williams. I stole these people's authority to make my expertise sound relevant and authoritative. I also referred to Richard Sennett, one of the main experts when it comes to new work. And I explained that these processes do not only have discursive or symbolic effects, I wrote that while notions such as work, work style can imbue social practices such as work with new meanings, they do not change the oppressive systems which constitute contemporary work. In fact, they do the opposite. They linguistically repackage work with a set of feelings and meanings that make it impossible for people to speak about inequality and exploitation with which in, uh, work is structurally entangled. Wow. I thought I made an amazing point. I had managed to challenge what I considered to be problematic understandings of language and work. That the issue I raised would make them think, would you induce change? When I sent my text to Hoxby, I asked them out of politeness, this is what we do as academics, if they wanted me to make any changes to this revolutionary text. And they did. And they did. They did not even ask for changes. They made the changes themselves. Three days later, I received a reply from them with their edits. I cannot read all the changes that Hoxby made. In order to save time, I'm going to focus only on some of the changes. The first changes was to add an entire new introductory paragraph to what I had written. This is what was added. I'm quoting. The link between language and human thought and behavior has been the subject of rigorous debate for many years. Due to recent advances in cognitive psychology, the influence of how we communicate on our actions has gained a renewed consideration. A powerful empirical illustration of this can be seen in the popular work of behavioral economist, Kate Chen. Chen demonstrated the link between the structure of language, of the language we speak, and our propensity to save money Futureless, languages, uh, futureless language speakers, for example, so languages without a concept for the future, will have 20%, 25% less in savings by the time they retire. Unquote. Language and human thought, cognitive psychology, behavioral economy, linguistic structure and the propensity to save money, futureless languages, this is not only absolute racist, I thought, but also absolutely insane. Even Wolf would turn over in his grave. Okay, another example. It's the last one, I promise. This is a paragraph they added at the end to conclude and wrap up my text. I quote, the research being conducted by economists such as Chen, as well as by academics in other dis uh, disciplines on the effects of language and human decision-making has the potential to change lives, and not only to the, due to the size of our bank balances. Language is the primary tool for expression and communication, and whilst we are not unique within the animal kingdom in our ability to convey what we mean, what sets us apart is our ability to do so with infinite variety. Variety that enables us to create, convey, and understand new words, such as work style, and in doing so, change the world, one word at a time. So language does not only make us richer, it can radically change our lives. Just introduce this new concept and poof, the world changes. No oppression, no racism, no violence, no exploitation, no social conflict, 
Work style is the solution to all our problems. Wow. Well, capitalism strikes back right in my face. My expertise delegitimized. They stole my critique of work and turned it into something else. From social critique to psychological celebration. My argument not just completely transformed, but transformed in a way that it serves the interests of capital, of exploitation, of oppression. I was outraged, angry, sad. Where was my critique, my resistance? How do they dare? What now, I thought. I was confronted with a fundamental dilemma. If I wanted to win, or maybe semi-win, if I wanted to capitalize on this collaboration, if I wanted to add that line to my CV, I had to accept their changes. In the first email, they had promised me that this collaboration would help me raise my profile. I would win, my university would win, Hoxby would win. But what about the revolution? What about my resistance? What about my critique of work? How far could my complicity go with the capitalist system which I always wanted to dismantle? I decided that this was going too far, that I had to refuse to contribute even if I would lose, even if this would mean for me to waste a possibility to induce change, even a little one. I withdrew and I told them that I was not amused. I conclude, we want to resist, we want to transform inequality, induce change, prefigure more just and peaceful futures, both within and outside academia. We want our critique to matter, to help change the world. We want to dismantle the very same oppressive systems that is feeding us our, as academics. Maybe change is not possible. Maybe change can only be partial, fractured, incomplete. Maybe we need to set a limit to our resistance. Maybe we need to decide what we are willing to sacrifice when we resist. Maybe we need to accept that the resistance is always caught in the very same system that you want to contest, and that resistance requires us to rebuild the worlds we have constructed from scratch. Maybe resistance is a romance, a fairy tale that makes us feel important, that makes us feel happy. Maybe resistance is more about ourselves, Maybe resistance requires power and exploitation. Maybe we are not just oppressed, but oppressors too. Maybe we feel good resistance. Maybe feel good resistance, kind resistance, nice resistance is too close to the happy workers that Hoxby wants us to produce. Maybe resistance need to be less kind. I have more questions than answers. Maybe this is our role to keep asking questions, to question everything to question oppression, violence, inequality, but also to question the revolution, to question ourselves constantly so that, the, so that others can keep asking questions too, their questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfonso, for this very thought-provoking uh, talk. Então, a fala do Alfonso aqui nos... Um, Mostra como é importante também nós, nós como pesquisadores, né, fazermos um trabalho crítico e reflexivo do nosso trabalho, né, de como a gente faz o nosso o conhecimento que a gente produz na universidade é, ser relevante no mundo fora da universidade e, ao mesmo tempo, é, é, questionar estruturas capitalistas e legados, legados é, coloniais que, que a gente quer questionar, né? Mas ele também levanta o fato, ele levanta o problema de que esses, essas estruturas capitalistas e legados coloniais são muito perniciosas. Né? Eles acabam cooptando o nosso próprio trabalho. Né? A, gente, a gente, então, ao tentar resistir às estruturas capitalistas e legados coloniais, acaba, de algum jeito, é, os perpetuando. Então, é uma, é uma fala que questiona também o que a gente entende por resistência. Uh, 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 I, I was just making some comments about your excellent talk, Alfonso, and I was, we have some questions on, on the chat, but I would like to start with a question. Uh, and that has to do with resistance. Uh, in social linguistics and in many areas, in many different fields, we have lots of different understandings of power. So lots of different definitions of power. And, and you say you explicitly engage with Foucault's understanding of power. And Foucault famous, famously said that where there's power, there's, there's resistance. However, that 
your talk also reminded me of a panel at the last AAAL in Pittsburgh, a panel that I attended, uh, in a panel about resistance, to which Sinfri Maconi was a discussant. And the first, and actually the first and only question that he raised to the panelists was, how do you define resistance? And in fact, we know what power is, we know what power looks like. We also, as social linguists, we also know what resistance looks like when we see it. But I'm afraid we lack a more, not precise, but a, 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 a more solid definition of, of what resistance is. And your talk problematizes specifically that. You say that when we resist, we also, we can't, we may also become complicit with power, especially co capitalist and colonial power. So uh, my question is, and it was fun because all, all the panelists there, when they, they heard the question, why is resistance? They, they were all rocked back on their heels and no one answered. So there was no answer. So I don't, I don't expect you to answer, maybe raise more questions, but how do you, re so I'm just relaying this uh, Maconi's question to you. How do you define resistance, uh, especially after, after uh, the, 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 all the this contradictory experiences you, you've had with power and resistance. Então eu perguntei uh, para o para o Alfonso como ele define resistência e eu tô aqui e essa não é uma, uma pergunta minha, não é uma, uma pergunta do Sinfri Maconi que fez essa mesma pergunta no, 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 no simpósio no, no, na, 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 no congresso da Associação Americana de, de Linguística Aplicada. Né? O que, que é resistência? E as pessoas do, do, do panel tiveram bastante dificuldade em responder. E o que a fala que o, que o Alfonso nos traz problematiza ainda mais o que, que a gente entende por resistência. Né? Então, Alfonso, let's just think here together. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, first of all, I want to say, I mean, whatever I say about resistance, I mean, it's not developed by me. I'm really heavily, I said it at the very beginning, I'm heavily uh, <coughs> drawing on scholarship within the language discipline. I think there is a fantastic paper uh, by Jackie Wola and Justin Helepoleia on this. Uh, there are there all scholars, Catherine de Bardi, what you call this. Um, I think that it's interesting the way you formulated, um, you know, the, the, what we know about Foucault and the question of power. What we usually say is that Foucault says where is power, there is resistance. But if we read Foucault carefully, when he says that where there is power, there is resistance, I think the way I'm reading it is that this resistance is not powerless and doesn't happen outside of the very same um, st structures, uh, oppressive logics that in which power operates. Right? This is the first thing. The second thing is also that resistance is not harmful. It's not, we, we usually have this idea of resistance as beautiful. But Michel Foucault's, his argument, the way I do the reasoning is, is the counterconduct. It's, it's also a form to do government, right? To, 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 to discipline people, to exert power. So maybe I think we need to move away from a romanticized understanding of, of power versus resistance, and maybe question about who wins and who loses from our ex ex enactment of power or resistance, okay? What are the effects? What are the effects? So rather than saying, what is resistance? Is this really resistant or not resistance? It's what are the effects? What is resistance doing? And and I um, just try to think aloud about what is my resistance doing? What effects is it having on whom, who benefits and who loses from it? Whether this is real resistance or not, I don't know. It's just, I'm interested in what are the effects of this, what we may call resistance. Great, thank you. Uh, so we've got, we've got some questions from the audience. I'll just relay them to you. So Daniel Silva says the following. Alfonso, I like your polysemic use of the first person plural we. 
Uh, here's somehow the true practice of resistance through, for instance, organizing the conference with Chilean scholars is inevitably related to a history of colonialism. In this sense, resisting is also recuperating colonial power. Maybe a question is, how do we handle this contradiction? Yeah, recuperating colonial power. Okay, so I think what is important, the use of we is complicated here, right? Because on the one hand, I want to be very clear, and I think I made it clear to my taxes, the first two projects I was talking about were done in collaboration with uh, colleagues. And we all have, we use the we just also to kind of, you know, signal that we didn't do this alone and also kind of appreciate the work that each of us has done. But within this resistance practice, if you want, we have all different positionalities and roles, okay? So putting us into the we is a complicated thing and probably also misleading. So recuperating colonial power, frankly, again, I mean, yeah, we can, you know, this is not the way I usually think. I don't think, I mean, we of course can try to see the way in all these kind of attempts an attempt to recuperate steel from the colonial apparatus. But, you know, I came to a conclusion for myself that maybe this is gonna make us lazy. I rather, want to focus on, on how is my attempt to steal from the corrupt, you know, recuperating colonial power reinforces colonial power. So I, I'm not sure I understand, Daniel, um, you're recuperating. But so if it means that I'm stealing from the colonial apparatus, then I don't know, we can see it in those terms. I see it that my attempt to steal feeds and makes the colonial apparatus rich. Thanks. So Romy is also in the audience. <laughs> she doesn't make a yeah. question, but she wants she waits a clarification. So I just read so everyone can follow. Yeah. Just for, for clarification, the purpose of the conference with the Chilean scholars was not to feed the constitutional process, but to put ideas into conversation and challenge them. Also, because most of the students were migrant women. So just that. And then uh, uh, against that 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 background, uh, Daniel again makes a, a, another question about coloniality. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll read the thread because there are other questions, other comments uh, that build upon this question. So coloniality is definitely a specter haunting us. And then he asks, how does one relate to a specter? And then Homi says the following. Then you'll see, because it's not a specter, it's material, it's embodied, uh, these collaborations are part of it. And then there's more on this. Uh, then you'll reply saying that I'm thinking of material specters. Specters only appear when they are embodied. I'm also thinking of an anodimer social linguistics of the specter, which is a way of engaging with language ideologies in many tradition, including Weber's spirit of capitalism. Specters are real. So that's the question and that's the exchange. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it is an interesting exchange, right? Because of course we can, um, I mean, I, I very much agree with Romy's answer. I mean, of course we can understand um, colonialism and capitalism as a, as a specter, as a structure of feeling. But when you enact these things, when you are there, um, when you write these proposals, when you present at conferences, when you put your body outside there, the specter becomes material and it hurts, right? So um, there is a risk, I think, for me. I mean, I, I, I like the uh, I like the, the the metaphor in the sense of you know the specter reappears and it's always there and then we think it's gone and then it comes back. But you see, the problem with the specter um, is that we tend to forget that it's material. Colonialism is material. It has, it, it is institutionalized, anchored within buildings, within institutional processes. We can touch it and we can touch the effects. Uh, uh, the specter, if you want, if you want to think, enters the people bodies and has material effects. I could see my students, and Romy is right to remind that, these were migrant women, most of them uh, 
because I think one person was was not a, a, a migrant woman. Um, uh, I could see the material bodily effects of their anxieties to put their, themselves um, there. So you see, I in this talk I tried to be very, if you want, theoretical, very concrete. Uh, that was an intentional choice because sometimes we hide ourselves against these very interesting and sophisticated concepts like the specter. And I think they are useful, don't misunderstand. But we shouldn't forget that they have material consequences in the here and now that can be touched, felt. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, you say that we need we we need no more heroes. Homie says we need more heroines. <laughs> I mean, that that's fine. I mean, if Romy thinks that we need more heroines, that's fine. I think that the logic of the hero is a is a is a is a wrong one. Uh, the hero is often associated with the white male slash female woman, uh, often from a privileged class. Who saves the other uh, to kind of uh, well, uh, feel better? Um, also, the, there is this really this implication of saving, with, which is encapsulated in the hero, and I think this is the problem, because again, the practice of saving comes always at, at some costs. I do think we really need to radically rethink what we mean uh, by transformation, resistance. Um, we shouldn't be naive about it. I think I have been, or I am very naive about it. I think we really need to think about what are we willing to sacrifice and then really understand that by saving, by being heroes, we are, we are sacrificing a lot. Not just our values, but also people. And the question is really who are we willing to sacrifice and who not and at what cost? Mm -hmm. Uh, Kat Tebaudi poses a very interesting question about resistance that shows the contradictions of the effects of resistance. She says, what I love here is showing reflexively aligning research in, in resistance with innovative methods in super neoliberal, but also the neoliberal Hawksby weirdos also frame themselves as resistance. Yeah. So okay. this is the thing, you see, I think this is why I prepared this talk. Because we are in a moment it's a very complicated moment in, within the field of language studies. I don't want to oversimplify. But one part of this process is that we are trying to do things differently, many of us, okay? And we are trying different stuff, and we feel good with it. Um, uh, we are transforming the field, implementing new, um, new processes. But we shouldn't forget that we are actually exactly doing the same that those people who we don't like so much do as well. So the question is, what is going on? If Hoxby and I have the same goals, then there must be something weird either about what they are doing or about what they are, I, I'm doing. And I think the moment has come for me to really think about whether I want to be a hero or a heroine and at what costs. And, what, and why is this so similar? Why does my language sound so similar like the language of Hoxby? And I could make a list of many other people who speak. In Italy, where I'm coming from, the Pope speaks exactly the same language that I'm speaking. Why? And what does that mean for my revolution? Yeah, thank you. Do we have more questions from the audience? It's now getting late in London, and because of the lighting, Alfonso looks like a specter now. Yeah, wait, I can, I, can turn on, <laughs> I can turn on the light, just a moment. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Just a moment. <laughs> so I'm back. Okay, <laughs> now you don't look like a specter anymore. Yeah, I'm talking about specter. specters. <laughs> well, so I think we've been here for an hour, and it was very good to have you with us, Alfonso. Uh, very, very thought-provoking uh, uh, talk, and I'm sure it will reverberate into our students and our research here. And that that's lots of food for thought for the semester. So a very big, very nice beginning of the semester for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. They helped me think. Thank you, Rodrigo, again for inviting me.
Very nice. Thank you very much. So, uh, obrigado a todo mundo. A gente acaba por aqui. A gente está aqui há mais há quase uma hora. Já está tarde em Londres. O Alfonso já está já tá escuro lá. E a gente está começando a, a, a nossa, o nosso semestre aqui com, com chave de ouro. Então, bom, bom 2022.2 para todo mundo. A gente se vê, espero que pessoalmente, não mais online. <risos> Thank you, Alfonso. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.